Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a terrific guest with a wonderful project, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Ever since the forum launched in 2016, we've been thinking and rethinking how to redesign higher education. We've had guest after guest who has been here to show us their ideas, their plans, their aspirations for how to redo universities around the world. This week's guest has a very, very exciting idea, and it's one that doesn't come out from the usual directions at all. Uh, Professor Anka Schwitte uh, has a book on creative universities, which, if I read it correctly, wants us to rethink universities by starting with by radically rethinking teaching and the, and the teaching and learning experience to empower students and to give them a lot of creativity and in so doing unleash a powerful critique of the university and to start transforming them as a whole. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, look in the bottom left hand corner of the screen where it says creative universities, click that, up you go to the publisher's page. But before that, let me bring Professor Schwete on stage. There's always this dramatic moment. I need a drum roll or maybe the Star Trek transporter noise, but either way, here we are. Greetings. Hello. Good afternoon and good evening, I should say. It's very good to see you, Professor Thank Trude. you so much. Thank you, thank you. How are you doing this evening? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me and, and thank you all thank you for um, being here. I'm getting okay. some feedback. Is that me or? Can you hear me well? Um, I can hear you just fine. Brilliant. Good. Good. Well, uh, I'm really glad you can join us this evening. Um, and as I mentioned to you beforehand, while it may be very dark where you are, I think your book is a brilliant ray of sunshine. Uh, it has you. so much going on. But before I get into that, let me ask you to introduce yourself in the peculiar way we do here, which is to ask, what are you working on for the next year? What are the big projects and ideas that are top of mind for you? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. So what am I working on? Um, it's uh, I'm I'm based in Brighton in the UK, in case you're wondering why we are talking about it being nine time over here. It's, it's just gone seven o'clock and it's very dark. I teach at the University of Sussex, which is, you know, on the south coast. So at the moment um, we are teaching and I'm teaching one of the modules I talk about a lot in the um, in the book and I'm also kind of getting ready in the next term to teach uh, my activism module and I'm sure I'll talk about both of them uh, later. But the other exciting thing is that I've actually just launched a spin-off project from the book uh, which is researching student housing cooperatives in the UK. Oh. Oh. And it came out from some of the students I interviewed for my book who were involved in setting up um, the Sussex University Student Housing Cooperative uh, about three years ago. It's the first one in the Southeast in the UK. Um, and since then I've learned there's uh, a few others um, up in the north of the country. And the interesting thing for, for you all is that the UK movement is very much inspired by student housing cooperatives in North America. And there's an organization not called NASCO that some of you might be aware of. So I'm learning a lot about um, student housing cooperatives in the UK and incidentally uh, Berkeley where I did my PhD has the largest student housing cooperative in the US which is really interesting so I'm working on this research project which is really really um, inspiring and fascinating well, that sounds fascinating it really does there's a lot to dig up there a lot of radical history um, yes. and uh, I know uh, you're very interested in alternatives to uh, modern or to mainstream economy uh, economic models, so that's that's definitely a counter for that. Oh, good! I'd I'd love to see how that goes. Uh, yeah, what I'd like to do is to ask you a few questions uh, about creative universities, and then I, I want to get out of the way and let the audience uh, really uh, have at it because this is a, a, a an exhilarating book with uh, so much energy that I I, I I just can't say enough about it. Um, my my first question to ask you uh, is. Again, if I understand this correctly, I mean, your focus here is on the teaching and learning experience, especially in empowering students to be as creative as possible. Uh, what are some of the most exciting ways of doing that that you've been seeing lately? Would it be the kind of the physical hands-on makerspace work that you're talking about? Uh, is it uh, uh, breaking students into small groups? Uh, what, what are some of the most exciting um, dimensions of that? Okay, that's a, a great question to start us off. 
yeah, I would definitely say for me, um, creativity um, and and making our teaching more creative um, definitely has a, a strong connection to um, the use of kind of arts and design methods. I'm very interested in the use of, of design for teaching and for international development, which is my field in general. I think allowing students to um, work with their hands, think with their hands through, you know, playing with material, through creating a kind of a right atmosphere is, um, is a really good way to uh, open up their creativity. So when I do um, design workshops, I make sure that before the students come in, tables are set up with lots of materials, anything from, you know, Play-Doh to pipe cleaners to Lego to, to, to blocks. So students, when they come into the room, they immediately realize they're being invited for a different kind of teaching session. And what's quite interesting is students' reactions, because uh, I, I hear so often when they open up a can of Play-Doh, it's like, oh my God, so that reminds me of my childhood. And immediately it's kind of this, you know, this, this time in their lives when they were very playful and allowed to be playful. And it kind of just sets the stage for a more uh, playful and, and fun experience. For me, fun is definitely a big part of that. Um, another element is um, allowing students to bring in their own experiences. That's a really big part for my um, kind of teaching where I definitely believe students hold great knowledge in, in their own experience kind of on and off campus so making space where i ask students continuously you know what does this mean to you how does this resonate with your own with kind of learning and, and life experiences is is another way in which you can allow them to bring kind of more of themselves into the classroom and i think then finally the imagination i talk a lot about using the imagination and imagining or reimagining how things could be in my classes and always say I want to create spaces where students can um, still be critical and we'll probably talk about that, you know, being critical and doing critical teaching is really important, but I try and complement that with this kind of creativity and emphasis on, on, on reimagining things. So that's my kind of three strategies that I use. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and these are each so powerful. Uh, I was uh, really impressed by uh, how, you know, among other things, the, the celebration of students' differences and, uh, uh, and, and what they could do, but also the, the return to childhood in that sense of, of playfulness, creativity, openness, beginner's mind, I, I think was, was very exciting. We have, we have a question that came up in the chat. I just want to run this past you before I get to ask you another question, which is, how do you do all this online? You know, if you don't <laughs> If you don't have the physical you know, stuff to play with, how do you do that online? That's a, oh, that's a great question. And maybe I can just really quickly say something about, I did the research for this book before COVID and I'm a, a big believer in in-class teaching, in-person teaching. That's my favorite way of teaching. And then I went on sabbatical in early 2020. Great um, timing. Ready, huh? Great timing. Great timing, ready to write this book and going, so I didn't have to teach, uh, but you know, seeing what my colleagues and the students were going through, going into lockdown. And I really kind of questioned a lot of my book and, and my publisher was really, my editor was really helpful working me through what this all meant. But then coming back into teaching, um, I found ways, um, I think most obviously, and I still do this, I use a lot of Padlets and Jamboards in my teaching. Mm -hmm. I actually think those tools, um, Jamboards are really easy to use kind of Google Jamboards, Padlets. Um, and I've in some cases um, realized that it's it, it's it's easier to use them. So I've actually kept them in in-person in teaching. Um, you know, we did all our teaching on Zoom and small group discussions, kind of well facilitated. And I was actually, I've always been skeptical of, of using technologies, but I was um, quite positively surprised by online teaching, hybrid teaching, I think is a whole different kettle of fish and it's never worked very well for me, but doing pure online teaching as we had to do for a while, um, it actually went rather better than I had expected it to go. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, I can second the vote for uh, Padlet and Jamboards, which are really, really easy. Uh, the questioner, Lisa Durf, says that you are a woman after her own heart. <laughs> Uh, then uh, th let me ask a, a, a second question, which is, 
um, how do you how do you translate all of that work? I mean, uh, the, you know, the hands-on play, the, the sense of imagination, the critical imagination, bringing their experiences in, and then how does that lead to first a critique of the university and the world? And then secondly, how do you, how can we turn that into a, an energy to redesign universities as a whole? Yeah. A little, little question there, little question. <laughs> yeah, I would say, whoa, um, not bad. So I think in order to answer that, maybe I would like to bring in kind of the second part of my subtitle, which is, is looking for alternatives and in the book, I talk a lot about how can we kind of move away from mainstream ideas, for example, about sustainable development teaching or about, you know, employability agendas. And again, this is the UK context, so I don't know to what extent it is, is as relevant in the US. But for me, asking students to, to reimagine economic systems or ecologies or their, even their own kind of academic subjectivities is always very much tied to think about radical alternatives. So alternatives very much in the sense of non-mainstream or heterodox. And I make sure that in my teaching, in my reading lists, I introduce students to, to kind of writings in this area to provide them with the knowledge. But then when we do our creative exercises, I always kind of try and push them and ask them, you know, how can we move into that direction of, um, of thinking about alternatives? Um, I see it as a critique of, of the neoliberal university, the marketized university system. So I have one of my chapters um, really engages quite critically with, with the employability agenda and with this idea of that students are coming to, to university, you know, to uh, um, you know, kind of be more successful on, on the job market. I'm saying it, it's really important. We are, we are, of course, preparing our students for life after university. We have to do that. But if it just becomes very instrumentally about kind of core skills and core competencies and employability skills, that's not what the larger purpose of the university is about. And I teach mm. at Sussex, which is a very, um, has a very kind of radical history. It was one of the first kind of post-World War II universities in the US. It has a very kind of activist history and we can talk about to what extent that is still alive. But within that context, also reminding students of this history and continuously talking about social justice, equality, mm. some of those, those primary values they run through kind of my teaching and the teaching of my colleagues um, very much and being engaged and, and critical and responsible and ethical citizens in that sense is kind of another premise yeah. that runs mm. through the teaching. I love that having the, the history, the identity of your university, which is a relatively young one, right? If it's from the 1970 or so. Yeah, just, uh, just celebrated our 60th anniversary. What's the, uh, the the nickname? The Plate Glass University, right? Plate the first, yeah, one of the first Plate Glass universities, which is well, in, in contrast to you know the Oxbridge, they are kind of the very much the red yeah. brick university. So they used big glass windows in their construction, and I think there were about six of them that all opened around the same time. No, that's that's very interesting to have that kind of. Uh, um, to, to be able to, to turn the history and identity of your university into part of the class. Um, friends, I, I want to stop asking uh, Anka questions and, and leave and yield the floor to you all for your questions and your comments, um, because she obviously has a whole bunch of great things to talk about uh, and, and all, all, all kinds of ideas that we want to share. Um, but just, just to remind you again, on the bottom of the screen, uh, you should have the raised hand button. If you want to join us on stage, use a question mark to type in a question, a few of you already have. Uh, and also, I didn't mention them before, but we have Wes and Radomski here uh, to help you with any technology needs. So if you have any problems with audio or video, um, Wes is there to, uh, to assist. Uh, so we have one uh, quick question that came up uh, from uh, John Hollenbeck, who is uh, coming to us from uh, Wisconsin, or miraculously not buried under snow and ice. Uh, and John has a, a word choice question that is a, a, a very deep one. 
Um, he asks, whoop, hang on a second, let me press the correct button. Uh, why do we still use the term pedagogy, child study, to educate, tell people what to learn? And I don't see evaluation addressed in the table of contents of your book. How does it play with your creative university? I guess those are, those are two different questions, uh, the term pedagogy and the question of evaluation and assessment. Yes. Um, maybe I can start by saying I don't have an education background. I'm an anthropologist by training. I teach, do most of my teaching on international development. So while I obviously engage with some education theory um, in the book, I don't have a deep kind of grounding in that field. And I didn't write it from that, that perspective. Uh, so pedagogy for me, I talk about pedagogy and I talk about us as, as educators, but pedagogy for me, um, probably came from the use of critical pedagogy to think about, um, to think about, um, kind of the, I guess at the heart of my book is a proposal for a critical creative pedagogy and the critical element of that comes from the critical pedagogy tradition of Paulo Freire, um, uh, yeah, Sarah Amsler over here and, and other people. So I think my use of the word pedagogy comes from there. I did not associate it with child studies, even though I do talk about people like Maria Montessori, Rudolf Steiner, Mr. Lotzi, um, in terms of kind of some, of some of the forerunners. But I wasn't aware of kind of that connotation necessarily. So for me, it was, um, yeah, I used it because of kind of this critical pedagogy tradition that I'm drawing on. Then the question of evaluation, is that assessments? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really that's a really good one, and I I actually have a I think it's it's in a footnote or something. So maybe I can just say that the book is very much written from my own teaching practice. I've been teaching for about twenty years in the U.S., in New Zealand, and now in the, in the U.K. And the book is really a reflection on my own kind of pedagogical journey, and that's why I talk a lot about what I'm doing because this is really the ground I'm standing on because it's, this is the only ground I was able to write from even though I interviewed a lot of students and my colleagues and I went into my colleagues' classrooms to do observations. Uh -huh. But a lot of the activities that I'm writing about are from my own classes and they are mostly non-assessed because I felt it um, easier for students to be more comfortable, to be creative, um, to be imaginative as soon as you, um, you know, introduce an element of assessment, there is a certain worry that, that comes with that. Having said that, um, there is a couple of larger projects I'm, I'm um, writing about, and one is uh, my colleague who does, who uses serious games, who asks students to design serious games in a class on kind of disasters and development, and then my own class on um, activism for social justice, where students design activism campaigns. And that's actually quite significant elements of the assessment. So in each case, it's 30%. It's a group mark for 30%. And I explain how it's um, really important to be really, really clear and supportive for how these different kind of forms of assessment will be evaluated. And of bringing students, or my, my colleague with the uh, CS Games, he brings students into the class and each year they are doing kind of a, a, kind of a collective design of assessment criteria. Hmm. Also just redesigned my Urban Futures module to bring in an assessed imaginative element. So I'm gonna do next term and I, I'm not quite sure how it's gonna go, but I felt, um, yeah, I felt it important to kind of, um, you know, walk my talk a bit more and actually put more value on these through assessments. So it's, it's, it's an experiment, but I know if it's assessed, I know students need lots and lots of support and reassurance because this is not where they're used to. They're used to writing essays, um, first and foremost, maybe, you know, a few related, but asking them to do kind of creative exercises. They need to be very, well structures and very well explained and supported for them to be assessed. That would be my comment on that. I really appreciate the the candor and uh, richness of your answer uh, because that's a that's that's a deep subject to to pull apart, especially within an institutional context. And uh, 
John, as always, thank you for the, for the excellent question. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of the text question. Again, just you know, so on the bottom of the screen, that's that little question mark. Now I want to give you an example of a video question uh, with our friend uh, Peter Wallace. We're going to bring him up on stage. Let's make sure this works. Hitting the button. And hello, Peter. Can't hear you. Your mic is off. Now, how about now? Now you're perfect. Okay, great. Sorry about that. No well, problem. We've got the technical challenges. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today and for the um, for the provocations and for rooting this in your own practice. I think that's like always really meaningful. I work, uh, or at least my my academic work is in open education, open educational efforts that involve students in co-creating a creative activity of co-creating materials that other students can learn from. Um, is kind of at the core. And my my core question for you is, how do you see critical creative pedagogy as you practice it breaking down or challenging or interfacing with um, the, the power dynamics that are inherent in classrooms? And there's an ongoing discussion in the chat about workplace too. And I was just reflecting on how success in the workplace also requires navigating uh, power dynamics, expectations for work, things that play into assessment in the way that we think about it. Um, because you are being assessed by your teachers and peers in the classroom or your, um, your, your peers and your, and your supervisors or whatever your structure is within, um, within the workplace. And I, and I think about this from a design lens, cause that's what I do for work. And often the worst designs are produced in highly uh, power loaded hierarchical mm. environments. So cool. anything you, you'd like to, to share on that, particularly in the classroom, because I'm, I'm continuing, I know you're, you're thinking about it mostly in that way, but community too is, is a really interesting space for that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really good question. Um, power relations, you know, do exist. And I think as much as co-creation, you mentioned co-creation, it's, it's a really, um, a really important concept at Sussex. There's lots of co-creation initiatives. There's money available for students to become co-creators. So it's definitely something that's that's um, on the agenda. And I think co-creation, if it's done in a meaningful rather than in a just a tokenistic way, if students really have the possibility to shape the curriculum, um, the reading list, um, in, including assessments, although in, in, in the UK, this is very highly formalized and you have to go through lots of hoops to change assessments and stuff i think it's a bit more open-ended in the us if it's still like when, when i taught there yeah. um depends on the school in my experience but yeah okay yeah um uh, but but co-creation um and i think it comes back to what i said earlier about making space for students to bring in their experiences and really say i you know, the experience you have, you know, coming here to university, the experience you have outside the classroom, but also in the classroom are really valid sources of, um, of knowledge. And um, I want you to bring them in, creating a space, obviously that's safe enough for students to do so. So presentations, you know, that, that might be quite conventional, but I think they're a good way for students, especially if students can um, maybe put together their own presentation groups, choose their own topic. I often recommend students uh, for presentations and also essay choices, pick something that you um, that you love. So for example, in my Urban Futures class, they have to write a research essay on, on a city of their choice. And I always say, you know, either choose a city that you know a lot about or that you really want to, that's meaningful to you in some way because it will make for, for, for a better essay. So really, in, in, a, in a genuine way, saying your knowledge counts in the classroom and then making spaces. So I have a co-creation week where I just give it over to the students and say, this is your week. You pick the topic, you pick the, you pick the format. And it's always amazing what students come up with. Um, but I'm under no illusion that this gets rid of, of power relations because, you know, I do put together the, the curriculum. I, I do the assessment. But also kind of, you know, I talked about creating a, a safe classroom space. So one of the elements of my 
critical creative pedagogy is, is whole person learning where I talk about, you know, students, you know, they bring their, their brains, their intellects into the classroom, but what about their bodies, their emotions, their senses, their experiences? Um, and yeah, I can maybe, can I, can I bring in examples? Can I, do you have a bit mm -hmm. of time? To, Absolutely. So, I mean, just, just the one in my Urban Futures class, as I said, Sussex is very closely um, located to Brighton. And in their third year, when the students take this module, they all live in Brighton. So we start off by um, the very first week, um, I say, over the next week, I want you to keep a, a Brighton diary. And I want you to become really aware of your lives as Brighton residents. You know, where do you mm -hmm. live, what's the neighborhood like? Where do you go? Who do you interact with? Where do you do your shopping? What are the places you avoid? How do you feel about your city? And they then they create an artifact. And that's a good example with the Padlet because before COVID, I would ask students to build an artifact and bring it into the class. And I have to say, I think it's the beginning of class and students are really like, so that wasn't very successful. But then during COVID, I just created a Padlet and say, take a picture of your artifact and put it on on put it on Padlet and write a small story around it. And it was amazing. And I actually have a, a blog post on my website um, because I have a, a writing blog there. And I've kept the Padlet. I've kept it on the Padlet because it works so much better. But from that kind of really, you know, students as Brighton residents, we then we write a collective Brighton manifesto. We, we do a Brighton 2050 scenario exercise and now they also have to reimagine a particular neighborhood and we're going to go on a field trip. So for me, that's an example of, again, handing it over to students, putting it on their crown, saying, you're telling me how, how you live in the city. Um, so th again, that's one way in which I want you to open up the space, um, which goes maybe some way to, um, you know, addressing power relations. The very, my very first chapter is actually about kind of remaking academic subjectivities because it, I think it very much starts with how do we think about ourselves as educators and about our students um, and our positions. And I'm very aware that I'm writing from, from a normative point of view by saying, you know, we should make our teaching a, a little bit more creative. So also being really explicit about the agendas we have. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if that answers your question. So I have um, a few ways in which I, you know, kind of try and bring in students more as, as knowledge creators, but uh, the power relations are there. Yeah, as you said, by the simple fact that I'm I'm going to assess them. And that's-, mm -hmm. that's big... and, and you're assigning what they're going to do. And, and yes. in, at least in the, in the US more so, they're they're paying to be there and you're paid to be there. Like that's a very real power relationship, right? But, yeah. but there's a lot of interesting things in what you said. There's still very, at least for me, very interesting threads too. Um, Cause it starts to, it starts me thinking about citizenship and locality. It starts me thinking about, like you said, embodiment um, cause power relations often demand, at least in traditional school contexts, a, a divorcing from body. And I think that's a, yeah, that's a really meaningful thread to pull on. So thank you for your answer. Thanks very much. I'm sure that there are many other questions I could, I could keep asking, but uh, thank You're you. You're welcome. Well, I'm really glad. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. And no, you don't have to have a beard in order to come up on stage. Um, you know, although uh, Peter's is coming along very nicely. Uh, we have more questions, uh, Anka, uh, coming in from a whole bunch of directions. And let me just put some of these up on stage. Uh, here is one from Tom Hames. Uh, who asks, should we still think of universities as a physical place or as a continuum between virtual and physical places? Or is it time to stop thinking about reading at the university? Yeah, this reading at, eh? This is, uh, and when you say that in the context of, of the UK, it's always kind of the Oxbridge, where yeah. students are yeah. reading at or reading a particular course. We don't, we don't use that language at Sussex. I think... I think, as I said, you know, in-person teaching is still my favorite mode. And I think the physical infrastructures of students are actually really um, important. And I've out of another project that came out of this book is a, a, a small group of faculty at Sussex across all different schools who are thinking of how to use Sussex campus 
as a more explicit space of, of pedagogical possibilities. And I have to say, so we have this really interesting architecture, you know, Basel Spence. A lot of the buildings um, on campus are, um, how do you say, listed because uh -huh. of the innovative architecture, which is yeah, brutalist yes. modernism. So, you know, uh -huh. love it or hate it. There is, um, you know, split opinions on that. But we are also uh, located in the middle of a national park, the only university in the wow. UK to be that. So we have an amazing natural ecosystem and we have, yeah. you know, a food forest gardens around us and we have um, a, yeah. an earthship house. So I think there is a lot of value in, in thinking of that um, the physical and the and the natural environment and the history that goes along with it and the relationships also as spaces of, of possibility. So for me, I think the physical university is is quite important. Um, for example, in my in my chapter on on design, um, designing futures, what? I talk about resource politics. And it became very clear to me, um, as I said, I did my um, PhD at Berkeley um, and during that time spent quite a bit of time down at Stanford when they set up the, uh, the D school. Some of you might be familiar with, you know, the House of Plotner School of Design at Stanford. So I was there very early on when it started. And then when I wrote the book, I went back there for a visit. And it's an amazing creative space. It's the space is amazing. The materials are amazing. The uh, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, coming back to Sussex, <laughs> we don't have those kind of resources. We don't have spaces like this. We don't have, um, you know, the, the facilities. And also I did some research in, in Bolivia as part of this book. I'm a Latin Americanist by training. And in order for me to think about alternatives, it was important for me to go outside of kind of the, the, the UK context. And looking at some of the, especially the public universities in Bolivia, the, the, the lack of resources is even more stark. So I think physical infrastructures and spaces and materials also remind us of the inequalities that exist in the resourcing, um, you know, especially amongst kind of different universities. I, I guess they come back to kind of Oxbridge, Oxford and Cambridge here in the... Uh, in the UK, which have massive endowments versus Sussex, relatively young and nothing to speak of. And I know in, in the in the States, it's it's similar. So it's it's really interesting questions um, to think about when we think about the material aspects of of universities. Um, you know, having said that, as I said, I do see much more value in online teaching <laughs> before COVID than I thought I would. I don't have a question, but... Oh, it, it's a great question, and, and thank you, Anka, for the answer. We have another question which fits right into that. Uh, and let me bring this one up so you can see this, uh, or right between those two polls. Uh, this is from Phil Blingard. Uh, please, can Anka share with us her experience which caused her to be uncomfortable with hybrid, uh, viewing it as inferior to pure remote? Um... I think the main reason is, and that comes back to resources, the technologies at Sussex was is is very poor. So we have a standard, you know, kind of kind of screen up on the wall, um, and we we were using Zoom, but it was a very one way because um, with hybrid teaching, the students on Zoom could never see the classroom, so we can see the students, and I found it personally really difficult to facilitate um, people physical people in the classroom and people online at the same time. I just, uh, I had a couple of classes where I had ATs and that was much better because they could monitor the uh, um, the chats. And and when I didn't have ATs, which are kind of teaching assistants, I would always assign a student and say, you monitor the chat to make sure that, um, that uh, um, you know, when students are asking questions and invite students to, uh, um, you know, kind of to unmute themselves and talk if they want to. But it's never really worked for me. And that maybe says more about kind of my teaching beliefs. Although I know from my colleagues, there is a sense. Um, and the steer at Sussex is at the moment, I don't know what the what it's like in the US, but we are in person only. We do not do hybrid teaching anymore at all. We are not allowed to basically for all kinds of reasons. We still record our lectures like we used to do before. But I think the general sense was it was a quite a 
a poor learning experience. And it's really interesting because the students are now asking for hybrid learning. They want to have, you know, an open Zoom uh, session running. And they said, you know, what if I can't come to uni because I'm ill or I have, you know, maybe a lift too far or, or whatever it might be. So now this comes from the students. And again, I think it raises really interesting questions about accessibility and inclusivity. And, and we are very much kind of grappling with that at the moment. But whenever I've tried it, it wasn't very, I think, satisfactory either for people in the classroom or on Zoom. I think that's that's my experience. Well, Philip, uh, thank you for the uh, really good question. I appreciate that. And uh, Anka, thank you for, again, sharing so much of your experience with that. Um, in, in the U.S., it's all over the map. We have a growing number of entirely online teaching. We have a big return to face-to-face, -face, but also some unyet documented bubbling up of hybrid and high flex in, in, in different ways. Um, we have we have more questions that come up uh, based on different points. And here's some pushback from uh, Kiel Dumsch, uh, who was asking this. Again, this is in many ways a question from the U.S. Um, I take huge issue with Dr. Schwitte's minimizing the importance of job training in college. Most students need to get into the working world quickly. And college is too expensive and time-consuming. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Thank you for putting back on that. And I think I, I hopefully I did preface my saying, of course, we have to prepare our students for getting out into the work of world after, um, after university. Uh, you know, student fees are massive. My oldest one just went off to college and took out his first loan and is paying interest rates right from, right from day one. So I'm, I'm absolutely aware of that. I think the way the whole employability um, discourse and practices have shaped up over here in the UK, it's it's really instrumental. It's all very much about kind of workforce readiness. And, and I do believe that, that universities have a larger mission around kind of, you know, educating a critical and ethical um, citizens and to think about kind of a wider project of, of, of social justice in my case, um, and coming coming at employability kind of purely from a, these are the employability skills, you know, kind of teamwork, um, communication skills. I, I think they are all really important, and and of course I'm building them into my um, into my teaching and make sure that students have the opportunities to to develop those skills. But I think kind of just focusing on that becomes very instrumental and then it becomes kind of, you know, workplace factories. And there's there's a massive debate around that in the literature, right? To what, ex what, what is the larger purpose of universities? And I think the economic reality of, um, of many students and their parents, a lot of our students are working two, sometimes even three part-time jobs to make ends meet, you know, we have a massive student housing crisis, which partly informs my project. And the, the, the maintenance loans that students are getting, in many cases, doesn't even cover their rent for the month. So I'm, I'm absolutely aware of the economic constraints and on the, um, the need to go um, and find a job. And I'm not, I'm not at all saying that's not our responsibility. But I think at the moment, it seems this employability focus seems to eclipse other more emancipatory and more transformative ways of teaching. And I think that's what I'm I'm questioning um, if it becomes too too dominant. Thank you. And that's free a... to push back further. I'm I, I I think those questions are really important. Thank you. Uh, and and we, you'll you'll see some of the forum folks uh, like Kiel have a, a gift for deep questions um, that really that really uh, go very, very far. And uh, Anka, you definitely have a gift in answering them um, very, very well. Thank you. Uh, friends, we have about 15 minutes left, so I want to make sure that you have your chances to ask questions. We have a few more in the queue, um, and I've got one more for myself, but I want to make sure that everyone uh, remembers to uh, to uh, raise their hand as they have uh, as they have a thought. Uh, this is one from uh, our friend Giselle, um, and she asked a question about your own background, your own past, uh, which is in your LinkedIn profile mentions your research on crowdsourcing platforms. Can you share more about that? Yes, yes. Um, I just give you a really quick 
biography um, because I think it's important to understand where I'm coming from. So um, I actually grew up in former East Germany. Um, so being exposed to kind of ideas around um, socialism, which wasn't working, then um, uh, went to Canada uh, for 10 years, studied, um, a, studied um, anthropology. And during that time, actually traveled to Latin America and worked with indigenous peoples in Latin America on kind of land movements. And then I got accepted into the PhD in um, anthropology at Berkeley and I arrived there in the year 2000. And it was the height of the dot-com bubble. And I was all prepared to go back to Argentina and do more research. And I was just so amazed by what was happening around me, trying to understand this. So I changed my entire PhD project and ended up doing a corporate ethnography of Hewlett Packard and their uh, global citizenship um yeah i know <laughs> global citizenship programs some kind of e-inclusion you know at the time it was about bringing telecenters and connecting remote locations so that got me really interested in the role of technologies um in development and then and part of that was an organization called kiva.org which some of you might know, definitely your students will know because it's very, very popular. It's, it's a crowdfunding platform around kind of microfinance where people can give small amounts of money that that gets channeled um, to, uh, to Kiva entrepreneurs. And that got me interested in, in crowdsourcing. So I had a project and also moving to the UK then, um, DFID, which was the, the development organization at the time, they had just launched a massive crowdsourcing platform with IDEO, the big the big design company again back in silicon valley so it's all interconnected and i studied i i studied that because i was quite interested in technology in the role of design um, um in terms of um development because by then i had pretty much shifted into development and that was an an uh, an interesting project kind of doing a lot of online research again doing research with ido and then i was again able to visit some of the projects that this crowdsourcing platform supported it was crowdsourcing in terms of the funding all came from different and the crowdsourcing in that case wasn't money it was people contributing ideas and developing presenting different projects which were done with the help of ido designers were being developed were being kind of awarded that that design support and again, I was then able to visit a number of these projects um, on the ground. I'm always quite interested what's the interface between technology and what's actually happening on the ground. So that was my crowdsourcing um, crowdsourcing project. Yes, I've, I've done research in lots of different areas, um, as you can tell. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's what that was. And, uh, and all over the world. I, I knew about Berkeley in Latin America. I didn't know about Canada. You are a globe trotter. New Zealand, five years in New Zealand. In New Zealand, uh, too. Oh, oh, <laughs> you're you all over. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Giselle, for the for the really good question. Giselle uh, runs excellent uh, uh, web study foundation and does really has a lot of really good thoughts about uh, about webinars. Um, we have another question that is coming in from um, oops, um, uh, Charles Findlay at Northeastern University. Um, and he asks a question, again, this is about how to do this creative work within an institution. Uh, we still have admissions, dean's lists, and scholarships, et cetera, based on grade rankings. Is non-grading grades a part of reimagining the university? Can I just ask what non-grading grades are? Is that kind of a pass-fail or sure. what, what is it? Charles, if you want to answer either in the uh, chat or uh, if you want to turn your camera on, if you can, and, and uh, just uh, I'll beam you up on stage, or if you can uh, type in another question um, to clarify. Uh, while Charles is doing that, um, I'm going to try and ventriloquize him, uh, which is always risky. Um, but this is, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, oh, sorry, he says no grades, just evaluations. Uh, that's one option. So instead of giving somebody a 90% or a B plus, instead you give them a written evaluation which describes how well they did. Mm. To be honest, I've never thought about that, what it would mean to completely get rid of grades. So I need to take that question away. Uh, I can't actually, it's not in my book, so it's not part of Creative Universities at the moment, but um, 
And I, I need to think about that. Thank you for that question. Oh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite an option. Um, uh, uh, Stephen Ehrman mentions uh, narrative transcripts uh, as at Evergreen State College, which does that. Um, and uh, I think Hampshire College has this as well, which is also a 1970s institution. Um, okay, interesting. And, uh, no, good question. Uh, very good question. Uh, and then uh, I have a question myself, uh, which is the, the prerogative of the moderator, um, which is to say, uh, if we take a university, uh, maybe Sussex, maybe anything, uh, and we unleash your idea on the faculty and the students so that uh, all the pedagogy starts transforming uh, and we start you know, following your, your lessons that you derive from Paulo Freire. We have the future imagining that you, uh, that you draw on from David Staley and others. Um, and you have the radical critique, the post-colonial uh, approach, the, uh, uh, what's the right word, pluriversity uh, approach. You have all of this going on. What does that institution look like in about 10 years? I mean, would it still be recognizable as a university or would it be something completely new and different? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a bit of future thinking. Um, I think I'm not saying to do away with universities. I think I think I'm, I'm talking about kind of opening up universities in, in Quite radical ways, and and, and my, my conclusion is actually it's very short, and it's a series of capstone projects where I really take my ideas on, on onto onto a larger scale. I think it would be a um, a much more um, kind of equitable university. So I talk about a thought experiment: what if we made education free again? Right? How would that actually change yeah. accessibility to um, to the university? What we introduced. What if we introduce some universal basic income scheme for in, in the university to address some of those economic economic um, challenges? So I think I would hope. So, so most of the ideas in the book are purposely quite small scale because I really want people to read this book and say, "Oh, I could maybe see myself experimenting with that in my own classroom." Mm -hmm. so it's. Mm -hmm. It's really written as an as an invitation to experiment and to try these things out, um, but thinking of it as a as on on a larger scale as you're um, asking me to do, I think it would reaffirm kind of reaffirm that 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 that, that public function of of universities to to you know educate kind of citizens, ethical citizens adhering to certain to certain to certain basic values but i i think they would still be recognizable as as universities i mean talking about you know student housing corps i've learned quite a bit about cooperative universities you know when you take like mondragon university in mm -hmm. spain mm -hmm. so there might be different models or there are people talking about the ecological university a university that is much more embedded within the community um and and has these these much stronger connections to community organizations and even industry kind of in the area. So I think it's a, it's a, um, there are definitely more radical ways to rethinking universities, but I think I would like to hold on to this idea of, of university, because I think there is, there, there is a lot there that, 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 you know, we can, we can take forward and we can, we can reimagine. Yes. I don't know if I answered that really well, but <laughs> you have, uh, and, 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 and thank you. That's, that's a fun, a fun way to think about this. I, I I'm just, I, my mind is start, starting to go off sideways and the idea of an ecological university and I have to bring my mind back. I mean, I can't do that yet. Um, it, it sounds uh, terrific. Um, like, like an example in, in these, in these capstones, I said, what if we do, we design campuses around allotments or around kind of a garden? As, as, a, as a space of learning, as a space of coming together as a community, of producing food, of learning about ecosystems and biodiversity. And, and what if that became the heart of a campus and we we build around this? So that's kind of one idea that I, you know, yeah. check out there at the very yeah. conclusion of my book. Well, if Sussex is, uh, if, if your forest is partly edible, then, you know, you could really... Uh, 
you build a, a kind of hidden university there, a, a secret garden college, yes. um, which, yes. would be, which would be very nice. There are people working on that as we speak. We have to keep we have to keep up with you. But before I can't let you go yet because we have st still more questions. Uh, uh, Kiel uh, uh, Doom connects his earlier point with your uh, with the grading point and wants to know what you think about smaller credentials uh, like certificates or micro credentials. Yes, I know. I know that some unis are thinking about it. I haven't really. I haven't really thought about that, but maybe if it allowed, you know, a group of students that can't do the whole kind of three or four years, maybe that's a way of making universities more accessible. I think at the moment, micro credentials, from what I can tell, are actually just a way for universities to make more money because they come up with short courses and certificates and that allows them to charge a lot of money to certain groups of professionals, which is probably not the gist of the question. So if we think of it as a way of breaking larger degrees up into maybe bringing it more into kind of this idea of continuous learning or kind of, you know, adult learning, I think there are real possibilities of, of, of reimagining that, but I haven't kind of put enough thought into it to kind of, you know, have a, have a coherent answer, but I think it's certainly um, if, if they were to be, again, developed as alternatives rather than as additional sources of income for universities, then I think there is, there's potential there. Very good. Very good. Gil, another really good question. And uh, Anka, thank you again. I, I appreciate your, um, your uh, honesty and, and thinking through this uh, with all of us together. Um, we have, um, friends, I think that's all for your questions. I have one for myself. And I, I want to just, this is actually about something that comes up in, in, your, in your book that we haven't talked about yet. And my Spanish is so bad, I'm going to mangle this. Um, you're, you're talking about an approach called Buen Vivir. Did I get that right? Yes, yes, okay. Buen Vivir. And, and, and you're, in your description, it sounds like on one hand, uh, uh, a very practical, very political way of organizing a classroom discussion on the other hand, it sounds like it's plugged immediately into a decolonizing uh, pedagogy. Do I, do I have that right? Can you say a bit more about that? It's, it's, it's more of the second. So when we were, I introduce it into my chapter on um, repairing ecologies, where I do, you know, start off with a critique of sustainable development education and then talk about alternatives such as deep ecology and, and ecocentrism, and then introduce Buen Vivir as an as an epistemology and, and a, an approach to think about kind of the ecological system um, of which humans are part alongside um, kind of, you know, other species from a decolonial perspective, because it's a concept that was developed by um, indigenous peoples in South America in the Andean region. And that's kind of where my Bolivian research comes in. Um, it's it has quite complicated politics around it, especially because it now has become part of the, the global development discourse. So any of you are Latin Americanists and are familiar, it's 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 very complex. But I, I present it as a concrete example to introduce students to um, to kind of you know epistemologies from the global south. I use kind of Boavitura de Sousa Santos's idea here. Um, and to, but also to show them how these how these ideas can develop in a particular place amongst indigenous peoples, and then can then be appropriated um, by you know the global development machinery as it's it, it's kind of happening. But also, and that's where the classroom comes in. I I also said we can think of some quite creative exercises. So, for example, when we think of and, and Bon Vivir was really kind of championed by Evo Morales, who was, you know, president of um, of, of Bolivia. And they, he had a big kind of a people's congress around that kind of the, the Pachamama, which is at the heart of this concept. And I said, if we think of kind of this event and the document that came out of that, and we could read it against documents produced by the UN around sustainable development, and then we oh. ask students to role play and to think of a, um, you know, designing a space in which these these could be debated alongside each other or read against each other and, and think of 
the performance and that that goes along with that so again it's quite specific to my field of international development so um so i kind of it it plays both of these roles but it's very much about this idea of of, of decolonizing some of our thinking around kind of education for um, um environmental education education of for sustainable development but i also say that we need to introduce our students to the basics of complex systems thinking complexity <laughs> thinking right because that's obviously um very important but yeah so that's when we were in a nutshell well well thank you thank you that that helps it, it really stood, stood it really stood out to me and I, I i wanted to learn more and and you just you just helped me learn more right away um unfortunately I have questions about your approach to gaming and everything else, but we're out of time. Uh, we've had a, a dynamic hour, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid we have to wrap things up. Uh, Anka, what's the what's the best way to keep up with you and your work? Uh, are you an active Twitter user or newsletter? I am, I am on Twitter, um, semi-active. My website, so creativeuniversities.com, I have a, a blog, which I set up actually as a writing blog while I wrote the book, where I talk about kind of new projects and upcoming things. There's also a, a resource section where I kind of provide worksheets and 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 yeah resources for some of the exercises. I have interviews with fellow educators, so I think the website is probably um, the um, a good place to engage. And then Twitter is where I mostly announce you know talks and and things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But can I ask you how how can we, is this chat being saved somewhere? Since I haven't had any time to read. Um, I can I can save it right now. Um, mm -hmm. I can save it right now, just with good old con you know, control uh, all and copy and paste. Um, I can do that right now for you. Brilliant. Um, and thank I can send you. that. Uh, thank you, Anka. This has just been a delight. Thank you for your book, for your thinking, for your generosity of time and energy with us. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do next, especially on student housing. Brilliant. And thank you so much for having me. It's been really, really enjoyable. Nice I'm to so meet glad. you all. I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank but don't you. go away yet, friends. Um, I do want to second uh, Anka's praise of you because you all ask such great questions. Um, and uh, if you want to keep talking about this, uh, we just mentioned Twitter. Of course, I'm active on Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me or ping my blog, brianalexander.org, where we have more discussions about this. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions on pedagogy, uh, redesigning classes, on gaming, on Paulo Freire, just go to our archive, uh, tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and you'll see a whole bunch of videos there. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we have a whole bunch of topics coming up. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. And if you want to share with me any of your work or ideas, just send me a note by email, and I'd be glad to talk with you and to share it with the community. Uh, above all, thank you all, friends, for thinking together. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation. I really appreciate all of you, and I hope your fall semesters are going well. Um, please drop a line if you just want to chat. In the meantime, keep working. And uh, above all, take care and be safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>